right, I think we're live. Um, so we're just getting started. I see people trickling in. Um, thanks to everyone for joining us today and spending your afternoon with us. Um, I think this is our third virtual Wertheim lecture uh, since March at the beginning of the pandemic. And um, it, it's a special lecture series for us. The Wertheim lecture series that they shared with you, Joe, has been one of the staples at the College of Business for many, many years and was made possible by one of our amazing benefactors, Dr. Herbert Wertheim. And it's usually a very, very big ordeal. So we'd love to welcome you back to campus when we can physically do it. Um, but there's usually a big crowd of people that come and get together along with our students, faculty, staff um, in a giant auditorium. But these days we are kind of bound to doing these things on Zoom. Um, and so we're really glad that he allowed us to do that. Um, I'm super excited to welcome our guest speaker today, which is Joe Martin, and um, a very proud alum of FIU. He is the founder and CEO of Boxy Charm. So I know there are a lot of excited ladies out there today, or makeup lovers, I should say. Um, Boxy Charm, as you probably know, is an online uh, beauty subscription where you get these amazing full-size products every month. Uh, I am a guilty fan, and it is Christmas every month at my house when I, my box arrives. Um, Boxy Charm is currently number 176, is the last I read, but correct me if I'm wrong, Joe, number 176 on Inc.'s 5,000 fastest growing companies. And you're on track this year to hit a $500 million revenue mark um, and started from scratch. So serial entrepreneur before that, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, studied business here at FIU uh, and started his entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneurship ventures while he was actually a student. Uh, so I, I am super excited to sort of dissect all of this today because we were just talking and might start with the fact that you started as an entrepreneur with $375 in your pocket. And that's that's pretty, pretty amazing. So I would love for you to touch on that, but maybe start a little bit on your background and uh, give the audience a little bit of a tour and getting to know Joe from the beginning. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you very much. Uh, first, I uh, appreciate you inviting me. You know, it's uh, it's actually very rewarding to, to see your school calling you uh, to speak. You don't think about it. You just do something. You do it on your own, and then they they tell you stuff. We want to hear your story. So I really appreciate that. I don't take it for granted. Um, and I do think that uh, I like the fact that there are entrepreneurial kind of like series where you bring people in to speak. Um, we need more of those. This is something that I was uh, I had one exposure at the time when I was doing uh, when I studied at the FIU. Uh, more is better. It gives you perspective. Uh, it gives you more, um, more. Uh, it just it does something for you when you when you hear stories from people. Uh, case studies are a big deal, and it's uh, it's nothing less than a case study right now. So, uh, I'll be glad to share my story and uh, tell you a little bit about my background. And by the way, Jen, if you feel you want to kind of like pause and ask me questions and direct me into a particular direction, feel free. So it's not going to be just me speaking, and then uh, you know I might be all formal like where you want me to uh, what you want me to touch. Uh, little, yeah, so I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about, my, about myself. Um, so first of all, about Boxy Charm, and then I'm going to go back in history and tell you how I built this and what is and what it's all about. So subscription box, those of you who don't know, uh, is basically monthly payment. You get a box every month into uh, into your home. It's a discovery concept. We we send uh, eyeshadow palettes, uh, skincare products, and so on items. You'll buy in Sephora, in Ulta, uh, the value of the products inside, if you're going to a retail store, would always be over $100, but you pay $25 for it. And it's uh, curated based on your preferences and, and, uh, and uh, your liking. You take a quiz when you start. So it's a discovery concept. You get a surprise, uh, great value behind this. And we grew our company. Right now, we're only shipping in the United States and Canada, but we're uh, shipping well over a million boxes every month. Um, there are other things, I don't want to break it, the whole thing, but that's the core business. And that's what Boxy Charm is all about. We launched, we fully launched the business in 2014. Um, but uh, I'm going to get to how I built this and how do you get to something like this. 
uh, that gross hundreds of millions in sales and uh, I'll take it all in and tell you my, my uh, background. So I'm from Israel. I came to the United States after I finished the military service in Israel. Um, I was there a couple of years, done the military service and uh, later on I came over. I started actually at the Broward Community College, at the time it was community. Then I was transferred to the FIU. Uh, went to business school and my sole purpose was to stay legal in the United States. I was an international student. Um, during the time I was actually at the Broad Community College, I was just trying to pay the out-of-state tuition. And um, I was trying to buy and sell. I was trying a bunch of stuff. Uh, and eventually I opened my first company and the first company was Merchandise Liquidators. And uh, the company was literally selling excess inventory by the truckloads, pallets and truckloads from CVS, Sears, and so on. And I know what you're going to say, like, and that's, well, that's how we started with a couple hundred dollars. Uh, and you're going to say, well, how do you get all this uh, when you only have a couple hundred dollars? I mean, you're a full-time student. Where do you get the resources? Where do you get them? So I didn't have any of those. I just flipped everything by phone uh, or via email. I get a list of how to call Macy's and ask them what you have on hand in pallets that you want to get rid of. And apparently there is a department for that and you need to know the phone number for that. And so it's with CVS and, and, and uh, Walgreens and uh, JCPenney, Walmart and so on. There are just ways to do it. And I just got a list of them. I've been searching for literally a year, every day, every night for an opportunity until I met one person, actually when I took a Spanish class and uh, she was, handing me over a list. She said, I work for a company that that's what they do. And if you want, you can do the same. Here's a list. This is what we need to call. And I told her, oh, yeah, but say I get that list. They send me that inventory. How do I get people to know about me? Right. And she, she said, well, SEO, search engine optimization. So I learned that there is a way that you can manipulate the results on the search, on, on the search engine to appear over there for free. And I said, okay, so I can create the awareness. I just got to figure it out. But if, if there is a way, I'll, I'll find it. What else am I going to do? Go out? No. And then I have the list over here. The third thing I need is a platform. I just need a website. So I learn how to code. Um, I get a Dreamweaver. I, I kind of figure out how to code and, and I build my first website. It was informative. It wasn't a transactional site where you can actually buy an item. It was, here's the, the list. If you want something, call me. You send me a wire. I send you the truck and so on. And ultimately, I, I built the website, built the awareness, did SEO. I was obsessed with that. More than the actual selling of the product, I was obsessed with the ability to, to rank my website on the search results on words like liquidation and closeouts, closeouts for toys, closeouts. I would be obsessed to see myself over there and figure it out and keep ranking high. And the phone was eventually ringing off the hook. I built a sales team and I took a company from zero to about 10 million in sales uh, within a couple of years. Mostly after I graduated, I had to graduate from the FIU to have enough time to dedicate to learn <laughs> business. But uh, I'm glad uh, we that's, kept it. You that's busy. when I learned about, uh, some, I'm sorry? I'm glad we kept you busy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, it, was, it, was, um, it was really, uh, school was instrumental for the fact that I had to go and, and have uh, a certain discipline to continue, and if I didn't have school to force me to pay the out-of-state tuition, I might have been looking for a job somewhere if I was allowed to work. Maybe I would have gone to Gapo Navy, get a job over there in, in the cashier, and that's it. That would have been the end of my academic, my entrepreneurial career. But because I couldn't get a job, and because I had to pay, and because of all that, you have to figure it out, and I don't want to go back to Israel now. So, I, you know, and, and then and here you are, you build your business and that's the only way you can actually produce money and pay yourself. That's the only way that legally you can do it. You can take a salary, but you can take a draw. So it was convenient and it was the only way. It's either this or go back home. Uh, and I didn't want to go back home. I mean, I love my home, but I didn't want to do it. So uh, eventually I heard about uh, the subscription box concept uh, around 2012, the end of 2012, beginning of 2013. And... Um, I was uh, kind of like at the best year we ever had in liquidation company. And, but I said to myself, you know what? I, I kinda, I'm sick of the business to business. Mm -hmm. uh, the business to business is a great business and I love that. Uh, that's what merchandise liquidators was. 
but the problem was that you have to chase the members. It's not, it's not a recurring, it's not direct to consumer. If anyone hears about me, he would never publicize, I have this best supplier over here that can actually, if you want to make st stupid money, come and buy from merchandise. Like, no one would ever do that. They would keep it as a secret. So you have to keep advertising yourself. You have to work on promotion yourself. And I didn't like that. But when it's a direct to consumer, no one has a problem or when it's a, a B2C, when it's a business to consumer, no one has a problem saying, look, I got this awesome deal with BoxyCharm and post this on their Instagram. And so they actually build the awareness for you. So if you give them a great product, you just have a bunch of ambassadors selling your products for you. And that was completely different from a liquidation business. So coming into uh, the subscription box, uh, when I heard about the concept, I had two questions about it. Uh, when I heard about the concept, I said, how do they, uh, what products do they place in? And they told me it's discovery, you just throw whatever you want. Mm -hmm. It wasn't really like that, but it seemed very easy at first. So I thought, well, that, that's good. I can throw any, any makeup item I want. I have a bunch of makeup items over here. Um, and then the second question was, okay, how do they advertise themselves? And they told me it's all social media. I said, okay, good. Social media, it's all algorithm. I kind of know how to play that out. I'll figure it out with Instagram. I didn't do Instagram, but figure it's just like Google at the time. I'm going to figure it out. And that was true. I mean, uh, I knew how to create the marketing. Later on, I had to figure out the product to place in a box. And then building a business is something that I've done before. So I was able to scale that business fast and quick again. Um, ultimately, I exit the liquidation. I sold it to a private equity. And uh, Baxi Charm now, obviously, is, is here. So that's kind of like the overall of what we did. Currently, the company itself, uh, Baxi Charm, has a couple hundred employees uh, servicing obviously over a million members. The, um, our office, we have a couple of um, locations, but our main office is here at Pembroke Pines. And um, we have a place in uh, Toronto, Canada, and we have another office in, uh, in Israel. We have other places outside um, that are not necessarily ours, like uh, those three locations, but uh, we get about 100 and some employees between Europe uh, and uh, in Asia as well. And, um, and that's pretty much it. Um, we, okay. <laughs> uh, about about Baxi Jam. Now, you can go and start with the question so then we can be more productive with passing information to yeah. our uh, <laughs> people <over> here. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And I, I want to get back to how, how you did all of that um, as we get into the conversation. I also just want to let the audience know, I forgot to say at the beginning, um, is to use the Q&A feature uh, for asking questions. And we'll have some time at the end of the conversation to ask Joe some of the questions you put in uh, into the Q&A chat. So we'll be able to see those as well. Um, but Joe, I wanna take it back a little bit because uh, we have a lot of students on the Zoom today. And I feel like your background has uh, a lot of commonalities with a lot of our students today. As you know, a lot of them, most of them are still first generation students who are putting themselves through college uh, are working their way through and in many cases supporting their own families as they're going to school. Um, and I know that you had that experience as well. So I want to kind of just get into the mindset of that a little bit and how you were able to do that and um, kind of yeah. share some of that insight. Mm -hmm. You know, I think, I think uh, the, the, the answer for that is do you really want it? If you really want to make it in life and it doesn't have to be just entrepreneur. Do you want to have a financial uh, stability for life. It really depends on the decisions you're making when you're young. Um, look, here's my first few years in America once I decided, once I started building my first company. Uh, never really going out uh, other than if I, when I was single, okay, I would just have a dinner after I meet someone online because I was not going out with my friends. I was all obsessed every day, 24-7, on just looking up for an opportunity before I even had my first liquid, my first business uh, until 3 a.m. just looking for opportunities online, just trying to figure it out. And then when I did, again, stay online every day until 3 a.m., just 4 a.m. until I would just crash on my computer screen how to promote my site online, figure it out by myself. Didn't have any mentoring, didn't have anything, and not even money, but I had my time. But the point, I never bought any clothes for myself, never bought nothing other than put everything I have 100% into building the business. I didn't care about the profit. I didn't uh, as much as I care about the fact that is it working? Can I scale it later? All I did was putting every second that I have, there is 
nothing, no leisure time whatsoever, just that. Um, so it depends. Uh, do you want it more than your competition? That's, that's how it is. How bad do you really want it? Because you can make it. There are no excuses. You can absolutely make it. So I came in. There's no credit card debt. I had no credit card. I had to pay everything to uh, at school. Every time I had money, I had to put it aside. When I had enough between putting it uh, into school and then whatever was left to me, I would put it back in the business. Yeah. I never bought clothing for myself for years. So the, the, the idea is that um, if you take the line that says um, an entrepreneur is um, in, you know, like living a couple of years like no one else would so you can live the rest of your life like no one else can is it's really a good sentence just how bad do you really want it think of a bodybuilder that doesn't eat anything tasty that has just rice and chicken in small portions six to eight times a day working very hard always sore muscles he wants it more than someone else right it is no different just go and do it and there was nothing there's no rocket science behind this i don't think i'm smarter than other people but at the same time, once you establish that and you said, okay, look, you definitely invest something into maybe nothing, okay? Because you don't know if you're gonna make it. You just invest everything you have in terms of time and you're responsible with money, but you invest everything. You just do not spend on anything that is not part of the cause, okay? Think about that, just nothing else other than that. Then you know that maybe nothing is gonna come out of it, but in your mind, you're so motivated because you don't believe in failure, you're gonna make it happen. Then comes the second part where you need to learn how to make the right decisions. If you invest your time into something that doesn't work and you put it for way too long, you're just, you're not gonna, it's, it's just not gonna help you. So you have to make the right decisions. You have to ask yourself, is it important and is it urgent? Those two questions are very, very critical. Everything you do in life, it has to be, what is the urgency and what is the importance? Some items are very, very important, but they're not very urgent. Mm -hmm. Urgency can overcome. So you kind of like have to have in the back of your mind a good intuition that's going to guide you towards the, making the right decisions. And those are usually the, the, the two weights that's going to say, what decision, when am I going to invest my time and resources right now into uh, right or left, right or left. And that, that's how your brain functions. And unfortunately, most of them are not in your front part of your brain. It's not part of your neocortex where I can formulate that and give this to you. It's mostly in your primitive part of the brain that's involving intuitions and you don't know why, but you just happen to make those decisions and it happened to be there and you, don't, you think about it, but you don't overthink it. And some of us have better decision mechanism than others. So if that happens to you and you are that much dedicated and you can make those right decisions, your outcome is gonna be uh, I guess not just me, I, some other people like me. So it's, it's gonna, it's gonna bear fruits. Yeah. I'm, I'm looking at some of the questions in the chat and they're pretty relevant to some of the questions I wanted to, to ask you, but I have very interesting. So how did you get your first hundred customers? And I've heard you talk a lot about how, uh, you really just studied and threw yourself into learning SEO and how to market. Uh, how to market first these customers on, uh, on my first company on, uh, or in BoxyCharm? I think we can probably talk about both because I just think of the resources that are available today, right? You were talking about building a website and learning how to code. I feel like there's a lot of cookie cutter things you can do today where you don't even have to learn how to do that. Um, so you didn't have those resources back then. So I wonder, you know, in your first, first business, how did you get those first hundred customers? And then sort of a, a second piece of that is that the makeup thing happened almost by accident. I love that story when you tell it because you just got to roll with it sometimes, right? So yeah. can you talk a little bit about that. So first hundred customers and then how uh, how the makeup scene fell into, into your So I, I can't really recall all 100 customers in my first company because it, imagine people buy truckloads from you and, and things like that. So it's just one customer can spend a lot of money. Definitely don't remember the first. It's more about the first customer versus okay. the first 100 customers because the first customer was actually coming. And I remember that very, very well. Um, I, I, uh, so I, I, I kind of like had to learn SEO and I had to build my website and... Um, I put the products in and you had phone calls and you just, the kill was not there yet. I was always comfortable talking, but I still didn't make my first kill. And it took me about two months until I made my first sale. And um, I, I mean, I'll use those terms. So don't go and take it for more. I didn't kill anyone, but uh, ideally is that 
it's uh, it's just uh, every time when you have a line until the first kill, the second kill comes much faster after yeah. like, in terms of uh, time frame. So it was uh, after the first one, everything was so easy. Um, and it was it was really coming down to a point that you convince a person to come down, even though they flew over to see you and you have no warehouse and you work from home and you have no inventory and all you do is send them an Excel sheet. But you can convince them eventually to drop 30 grand or 20 grand and you make yourself sell. I mean, in my case, it was uh, Victoria's Secret items. Uh, they wanted to buy some bras and, and shirts and, and so on. And I had no inventory. <laughs> And I had a supplier, I, I called a supplier when someone told me I'm flying over to Miami, I'm gonna see the goods. And I said, uh, yeah, sure, come over. First, you, you gotta say yes. You don't say no because you kill your own sale. You first say yes, worst comes, worst comes to worst, he doesn't buy. Yeah. So he said, I'll, I'll fly over, I'll see your warehouse. I told him, yeah, sure. And in my mind, I figured I'll take him to a restaurant and I'll show him products. And if you ask, I said, I'll flip the goods. I'll, I'll be honest about that. And um, what I did was I called the supplier that, I've never spoken with and I, I said, look, I need some samples from you. Someone is coming over. I'll pay you for the samples. And he said, no, it's fine. I'll overnight it for you. I'll, I'll give you for free the, the samples. And he trusted me. He sent me over. He said he's going to send it overnight. Now, the guy called me after and he said, I'm going to be in Miami, but um, I'm not going to come to your office. Um, I'm going to have to catch another flight. Can you come to the airport? Uh, better. Absolutely. I'll go there. No problem. I'll visit you at the airport. So he said, uh, I'll be there on 2 p.m. So I wake up, I, I, I get a, a, a knock on the door in, in the morning. The guy, uh, FedEx, dropped the, the samples. I went over to the guy. The guy doubled his purchase. He wanted to buy something for, I think, 12 grand, and then eventually it was 24. Um, we made friends over there. We were talking about everything in life. Um, it was easy. Uh, he sent me the money. I ended up calling the supplier after, then I negotiate, I renegotiated the price instead of profit of, I honestly can recall, but instead of making $4,000 in that sale, I ended up making eight because I, uh, I renegotiated and that was exactly what I needed to pay the out of state tuition at the FIU and I had about three days and no money. And eventually that's what pays. And at the end I was left with, I think with $160 in my pocket because I came over and I, I paid that, uh, that out of state tuition, which was bittersweet, but was more sweet because I can stay legal in the United States. Yeah. That company, that was my first sell. And I really ran out of cash. I had no more money to pay. It was pretty expensive and, uh, and that's it. It really saved me. And then, but then I'm, I'm back at square one with a hundred and something dollar. And then eventually uh, you keep uh, growing from there, but that was, that was my first sell. Wow, that is amazing. And, you know, people forget out-of-state tuition for those who are not international students can be two to three times what in-state tuition students pay. So yeah. probably not inexpensive. Uh, At the time, it was about 20-some thousand uh, for the whole year. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think it was 7,000 per semester. So if you do three semesters because you want to finish the thing fast. Uh, well, actually, you know, nine, nine. And then in the summer, it was 7,000, not including books and not to mention that I have to leave and I have to eat and so on. So that was just yeah. that. How did you stay motivated? You know, I know that you said after your first kill, the second becomes easier. Um, but, you know, going through all of that, making a few thousand dollars to pay tuition, you have $160 all over again. How do you, how do you keep that ambition? How do you keep that, uh, that drive? So I think what motivates you is, is not what you think is going to make motivate. You. I mean, if, if, if you look at a guy like me, when I started with, with literally nothing, I had nothing in terms of uh, resource, uh, income coming in. And even though you would think, well, you have to be motivated and you only get the reward when you sell, this is not true. There are so many motivators in between to continue the motivation. So you build a website, now it looks nice. Now you get a phone call. Oh, wow, that was good. I almost closed it. Okay, why is it not from? You, you have so many um, uh, progression points that uh, give, keeps that motivation. Uh, and then you also have discipline in between because you're always going to have a raining day. And if you have some discipline, that's what's going to keep you going forward when you don't have the motivation. Motivation is a key, right? You, you have to have motivation. You have to want to want to do it. If you, if you don't want to do it and you decide not today, let me just go and watch that game or let me go and do something, like, then you don't want to do it. You want to go and watch that game more than you want to do something. Figure there is always something to do. But if you're really obsessed, just obsessed with doing that, you don't need much motivation uh, pointers out there. Mm -hmm. You just 
want to do it because you want to build the website. This is your goal number one. I guess the, the answer would be more, don't think about the long-term play where you start selling and you start seeing cash and you can enjoy having great lifestyle. And so think about the little points, okay? This is short-term goals, lots of short-term goals that you have along the way. And you said, okay, now I started ranking in that key term. Oh, I'm on the first page on the bottom, but I'm on the first page. Whatever I'm doing is working. So in your mind, it, you're, you're not standing in the same spot on, and you only moved when you made yourself. You have mm -hmm. so many moves that you made up until you actually got into that. So, and that's what keeps you very motivated. I love it. My favorite quote of the day so far is you just don't believe in failure. I think that that talks a lot. It gives a lot of insight into how, how you think, which is really one of the things that I wanted to put on display today for, for everyone on the call is, you know, the mindset. There's, there's nothing in a business curriculum that teaches you how to think that way. Uh, so I think it's important for you to share you know, maybe a little bit about what you've learned. What were some of the challenges you faced as an international student who was trying to be an entrepreneur? Um, and maybe some of the things you would have done differently throughout that. Surely mistakes uh, were made. I wouldn't, I wouldn't change any mistake. Uh, I kinda, I'm <laughs> glad I made mistakes in the, in the beginning because it's like a childhood disease for me. You, you want to get it now so you don't have to suffer a much worse outcome when you grow and you're much more compromised when you grow your business but uh, when you when you basically start uh, your business right you're gonna run into walls raining days mistakes you're gonna fall you're gonna get out you're gonna fall you're gonna get out eventually you're gonna start running without falling so many times and and then you're gonna get a perspective that you cannot receive if you have not made any of those mistakes if everything mm -hmm. was given to you and you get really really lucky look you have you have uh, learning curves, uh, and everyone needs that, okay? When you go to school, you don't experience that because you just go, you go to school, you have a class, you move to another class, and that's when you're actually going to life, no one is going to be politically correct with you. In uh, sometimes will, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you that you'll see things that you're not going to experience in school, right? You need that. You need that, uh, that experience. And it, when, you, when you look at um, decision-making, which I said before, what makes you make the right decisions? What influence you to gravitate towards the right decision? And I think that is the biggest, uh, the biggest attribute for, uh, for a company where the, the founders or their CEO is actually deciding to attack Russia in the winter. Okay, well, they're going to die. Okay, so it's a, he's making the wrong decisions. And why would some decide, okay, we're going to retreat. This is not the right move. Like, why? And, and this is coming down to... Look, look historically, what happened with that person? What experience did they have? How did they cope with them? And then they needed to make those mistakes before. They needed to know that Siberia is not a good place to visit in the winter. And definitely you have to get a sweater when you get there. It's like you have to have those experiences, but then you can process everything and just explain this in formal. It just sometimes it comes intuitively and your brain is going to warn you, yes, for this, no, for that. And just don't worry about why. We've just seen this in the past and I can't give you all that information because it can be too much input. So experience is a key. Experience is very, very important. And whenever I hear someone said, I want to start my business, but not right now, I got to finish something or the economy is not good, or I have to wait for my cousin to come. I just, I hear another, another person just talking and all you have is an idea. You never, you never activated on your idea. You're just, if you were to start already a year ago, you told me about this, you, have, you would have, you would have had a year experience. You would have been a different person. You change. It gives you a better perspective. It gives you a better intuition. You would have been a better leader. You would have been a better everything. You would have been a year advanced more than someone else. So that, that's my, uh, my, uh, my thing. Just go ahead and enjoy your mistakes. You need them in the beginning. So you brought up a really good point. We talked a little bit about this, um, but not too much. So I, I hope it's okay that I asked, but starting a business today, what would you do differently? So you are Joe Martin back at FIU today as a student. You want to be an entrepreneur, but it's the middle of a pandemic. The world is insane. It's 2020, all the 2020 things. What do you do differently? What do you, what do you change? So assuming the work ethic is the same, assuming of course. you start, you don't ask questions, no excuses, go ahead and make it happen, right? I would yeah. say focus on marketing first. 
learn how to create awareness better, faster, and cheaper than your competition. Most yeah. people are not going to do it right, and that's a good thing. Um, there are multiple ways to create awareness. Uh, the world is getting uh, flat, flatter and flatter. So you can think of your product that you want to sell. Ask yourself, is that a good product? Can I get repeat clients? If you don't, don't, don't go there. Get, make sure that there's going to be some sort of loyalty for the product and the net promoter score, which I'm sure a lot of you are aware, is it how many people out of 10 people that have bought your products would go and promote it. If you find that it has a good net promoter score, the, the product sells itself or a service, okay? Sells itself. Now we're looking at the awareness. How do you build it? And you go and you learn that, okay? Do social media. Learn. That's the future. Focus on building, uh, learning how to create awareness. Uh, pay-per-click and all those. I mean, that's part of that. Just go and learn. Search engine marketing, SEO, uh, social media marketing. That would be a, a tool that you need to have in your uh, toolkit because it's not going to go anytime soon. I can promise you, it's un magazines are not going to take over again. That is not going to happen. It's going to stay the way it is right now. It's going to be more fragmented and, and so on, but it's going to stay the same way. By the end of the day, there's going to be an algorithm and you're going to have to understand that. Then you're going to have to have a great product and so on. So learn marketing. Everything you do, start with awareness. If you get them cheaper than your competition, you have the upper hand uh, on your competition. So is it safe to assume you would give that same advice for somebody who's already in business? Um, a lot uh, of times the marketing team is the first to go when, when things are not going so pretty. So, um, I mean, the marketing, the marketing would go, like, here's the deal. I mean, I, I can shoot holes into that. Um, yeah. I, I would never fire in. I mean, we're doing good because we're direct to consumer. I think if a company just doesn't make sense anymore, it doesn't make sense. If you have, uh, brick and mortar stores and people are all locked up at home and you have to fire people because you don't have salaries, then it doesn't matter what, you know, the whole boat is sinking. It's not just one part. There's nothing you can do. But if the company is good and they're actually looking at what they're doing, marketing is not, the, it's going to be the last one that's going to go because that's going to sink everything else if they go away. So it really mm -hmm. depends uh, how good you are in marketing. I can tell you that creating awareness, if, if it's going to be people like me or, or friends of mine, any business you can bring on our way, first thing we're going to gravitate is how do we sell this? Okay. I like the product products of itself. I can disrupt the industry only or have is five conglomerates that that on the market. And just, I can, there is no uh, fragmentation within the market. So it's just not, you're not competing with too many people. Okay. Now I know I can disrupt this market. And I also know how now let's talk about the marketing and how mm -hmm. can we go and deliver the product faster, better than, and cheaper and, and, and so on. So this is going to be the first mindset, uh, people would go um, mm -hmm. and marketing is going to be the key. I love it. So talk to me about influencer marketing and how you did it. I know, uh, I remember you telling a story that you didn't really spend much money on actual marketing at the beginning anyway. Um, and, and you started to build some of these relationships. And so can you talk a little bit about how you encountered that and how you decided to do it? Yeah, um, so we, we grew Boxy Charm, I think, right, right above 100 million in sales without any uh, spend. Out, the only spend we, we did was with influencer marketing. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then we started learning uh, performance and so on. But um, influencer marketing, let me start with one thing that is not going to go anywhere. Uh, I've, I've heard a bunch of people, and I, I mean, I, I told Jenny, listen, you got to forgive me. I'm, when I'm talking to friends, I'm... I'm completely different than what I'll talk to your team. So do you want me to be me and more uncensored? I'll, I will be because and she said, please do. So I'll say, look, most people that are going to be doing marketing are a bunch of idiots. They, they basically ask the same question. What's next? What's next? Like nothing is going to be next right now. Influencer marketing is going to stay for a very long time. Just like radios, TV stayed for about a hundred years or so. Like it was, it would stay for a very long time. It, it's not going to go anytime soon. And if anything, you have to, adapt to it, even though it gets more and more competitive. So influencer marketing was significantly less competitive because there was less input for the influencers in terms of brands that would go and ask them to promote anything. So you look at 2013, 2014, when I started, they, they did, just didn't have too much commercial content running through those channels. When you had uh, an influencer with a couple hundred thousand followers, they just talked about what they liked and that's it. They liked to see the engagement and they like to see how they're growing. That was their, their goal. But then all of a sudden, someone's going to come and offer them some money for their product. So now if a person never ever sells anything uh, for the sake of selling it, 
they just talk about what they like, eventually one item is being sold without hashtag ad or so on like it is required today by the FTC. People will buy it. So they're much more influential. Today, they're significantly less influential because people already know the game. People have uh, filters when they listen to social media. The input for influencers is much higher. But you need to know how to work better than your competition with influencers. See, influencers have one goal if, they're, if they know what they're doing, right? They want to stay relevant. They want to stay influential. So if they'll talk about something that's actually relevant, it would keep them relevant. If you are uh, in my space, okay, if you're a beauty influencer and suddenly I'll come with the teeth whitening uh, product that doesn't agree with their, with their platform, many of them would say, I'm sorry, I know, it doesn't matter how much money you're gonna pay me, I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna promote that because it's gonna kill my relevancy. So you gotta go to those influencers that are willing to talk about this and they're still relevant. You look at them. If they are talking about products that makes no sense, they're not relevant, don't work with them if they're not relevant. Invite them, be their friend, it's important because you're gonna be in their clique. But don't, don't spend your money on those. Go to the ones that are actually talking about, they create an authority within their channel. Their channel is their own media channel, right? And then if they always talk about what they like and what they believe in and they, they really are genuine, even if they promote an item, people will believe them. So you just have to be more selective and a little bit more informed about how to work with influencers. And eventually when you uh, know how to negotiate, you can get better deals and then work with more of them. The good thing is when you do work with lots of influencers, uh, it's, uh, it's kind of like the rich get richer where all the influencers talk about something, it makes no sense for them not to talk about, about you. And if yeah. you just send them a box for free, they'll talk about you because they know they're gonna get the engagement because you're relevant. So that's how, uh, that's how we basically uh, uh, work with influencers. Uh, I mean, we can talk about how you guys can be more influential. I don't know if that's a topic you want to cover, but... Uh, yeah, that's... no, I think that's great. I, we should definitely get into that. I, I'm curious, though, for you to sh uh, share a little bit about how you choose them. I know there's a real sweet spot for you and how you and when, what the timing is in terms of how popular they are and where they are in their career and that sort of thing. I mean, we believe in relationship, first of all. Um, the, there are some... Well, let's talk about how you start, right? So some of them uh, we meet on the, um, really early in their career. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are some triggers that uh, I, I kind of look and I also teach my team how to see like who's going to trend and who's not. And you want to meet them when they're early because you're one of the few or maybe the only one that shows up with an offer and, uh, and you invest in, uh, in that. And then you also go to the big ones. You know, uh, some big ones are relevant and you still need to work with them. But because you're relevant, they're going to charge you less. So for small ones, I think uh, many of you know uh, Kathleen Light that we started working with um, She's a big beauty influencer. When she was at 100,000 followers, I told her you'll be at a million in less than a year, and she did. And uh, today she has four or five million followers, and, and there are more. I mean, now I see it on TikTok, and I can find out who's the one that's going to trend on TikTok, and this is where it goes. And so you'll go to those, and uh, you go and you find them when, uh, when they just start. But then you build real relationship with them, because once you're already too big, imagine you have too much input of people coming in. Sure. You have to put a filter. Talk to my manager. Do it's very less, um, there's just less uh, introduction of meeting the, the, the CEO of the company and so on. Ideally is you want to pierce that. You want to meet the person one-on-one -on -one because when they'll talk about your product, they're actually going to like you and they're going to really support your brand because yeah, there's the transactional part, but I actually like the founder. He's an awesome guy. And it's, it's important for them. To, and it, it's in their voice when they, when they talk about your product. It's in their sound. They can be part of your team. So we've done this. And today we're in a, in a really sweet spot because we're very good friends with so many influencers. So we always bypass the, um, the agents because it is just a given. The influencers want to meet us directly. Just part of that. So we work in that direction. But when you start by yourself, Build the relationship with them directly. You, one-on-one. -on -one. Start with them one-on-one. -on -one. Build relationship. The big question is why. Why would they want to work with you better than someone else? Why? So sometimes you'll find people that no matter how good friends we're going to be, if you don't pay me that amount of money and there is no discount, by the way, I'm not going to talk, I'm not going to talk about your product. But some of them will say, you know what, don't, don't worry about it. First one is on me. And, mm -hmm. and then you start building those. So eventually you'll find yourself getting a lot of mentions that are better mentions and much better cost. 
That is amazing. So going back to what you were saying about um, how we can be more influential, and I think people in the audience want to know, um, you know, what are what are some of those tactics, and maybe even some of your negotiation tactics. It seems like you've been doing that for quite a while. Well, I mean, negotiation is not going to help you being influential on social media. I mean, you create content as uh, the, 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 the idea is content is king, right? Um, there are plenty of ways to be influential, different platforms today. Uh, it's not tied to one and each one has their own way. My, my thing is when, when you think about where you want to get somewhere, uh, I really like to look at the macro and know your, uh, you know your space and uh, who you compete with. And if you find someone who does it well, just follow that doctrine that they're going with and, and learn from that and continue from there also associate with people um associate with people that are very uh much gonna be in the space you want to be in it's just gonna help you it's gonna give you a lot of leverage and it's gonna give you a lot of data points for you to understand what the do's and don't do's uh if you're just gonna now some people just blew up out of their cave and never associated with anybody because it just happened but it's more like getting struck by lightning you can count them on one hand but <laughs> other people were informing themselves very much and decided to associate with the, with that particular community of influential people, people with followers, taking pictures with them and so on. And little by little start understanding why some are training better than others. And then uh, you build it up. But ideally is that it just, it can be part of just lots of dedication and hard work like anything else. Uh, mm -hmm. In, in, uh, in Baxi Chum, it was a bit of a different because we're a company. It's not a person. It's a whole different perspective, but because a company has lots of mentions coming from other people and then the members want to find out on social media some tricks and some new uh, products that are going to be in a box. So they want to follow you. But for a person, it's really important to create consistency and work around other influencers, meet them, be in their clique, keep going over there and, and focus on the product that you say your product is your content. So give them great product. So I'm getting a lot of questions in the chats. Um, there's about 25 of them, so I don't think we'll be able to get to them. We have about 15 minutes or so left, and I want to be respectful about everybody's time. But um, I'm scrolling through here, and I just want to kind of group some of these together. But there's a lot around the topic of, you know, how much time do you spend on a business that maybe isn't going as planned uh, how do you know when something's a good idea or not? Or how do you know when to, when to quit, essentially? I like this question. Uh, that, I like the question. Yes, you do need discipline. Uh, don't commit suicide. Um, take a mortgage on your home and so on. I, I would never advocate for that. I would say invest your time. Don't be afraid to jump into the... But uh, you do need the discipline. Um, and so in Boxy Trump, for instance, I'll just tell you for mine, I, I don't think I have a formula that works for everybody. But in my case, I had a liquidation company and I was doing pretty good. But then eventually I found that, okay, Boxy Chum might be the biggest thing ever. Let me go and try. I used some of my resources in liquidation. I had warehouse space. I had office space. I had employees. Um, so what I did was I said, I'm going to start. And when I saw that I, the first month or so, it was horrible. It, we hit a wall, people didn't like the product and, and so on. I knew how to create awareness, but I'm creating awareness for the wrong product. Uh, so the products we placed in the box were not the right ones. So I said, all right, look, apparently the products that I have from the liquidation are not the ones I need to place in the box. I need to figure out how to connect to the brands, get their products, convince them that it's going to be the best thing they ever do for themselves and put it in the box and then sell it and still turn profit behind this. I don't know if it's going to work. I will give it 12 months. That's what I decided. I'll mm -hmm. see if I see a proof of concept. I'm not, I'm not looking to be profitable. I want to see a proof of concept, but I was profitable right away. Apparently. As soon as the whole thing changed, it worked. And, but you do need to have a certain timeline. Ask yourself, what are the resources that you're willing to do uh, to, to dedicate? Don't kill yourself financially. Don't commit financial suicide. That would be reckless. I've seen those and that's a dark side of entrepreneurship. Don't do that. <laughs> it's like, believe me, don't, but, be disciplined, say, look, I'll give a certain amount of time. Usually a business needs about a year or so to, to understand where it stands. But sometimes you can tell really from the get-go, it's, it's not a good idea, guys. Nobody like this. That invention doesn't work. It burns people's hair. Just whatever, kill it. And so don't, don't commit to the 12 months. Let's continue selling this hair product, even though it messes up your hair in your face. Like, don't, just kill it right away. But if it works and you see that people need some tweaking in the product and so on, do it, Okay. And then it would also hit into, I mean, talking business school, uh, product life cycle. Okay, you start with something, you're doing great. 
it, that, that's the introduction of the product. Then you start seeing competition and imitators and so on. Now it's time to tweak it. Don't forget, now it's the time to press the button, tweak the concept, make it better than what it was before. It's time to evolve the concept. So it's just, there is the time where you need to shut down the business. There is the time when you need to evolve the business. So you don't get stagnant and, and get comfortable in your own seat. Yeah, so you talked a little bit about, you know, not digging into, you know, not digging a big, big hole. I'm getting a lot of questions also about financing, venture capital, um, loans. What are, what are your thoughts on that? I know you were more of a bootstrap guy. Um, but it really comes down to what business it is. I don't want to, I don't want to go and tell you that I did not start with someone else's money. I, I started everything from scratch, but, but I mean, when I started Boxy Charm, I had my own cash. I put half a million of my own money in 2013, 2012, 2013. So I did have cash. It just happened to be mine. And I wasn't experienced in going, getting cash at the time, going, writing. It off. So there is a good and bad in both of them. I will say though, that, um, if you can go with your own cash starting something, great, do it. Uh, if you don't have uh, your cash, then you'll have to be very good at getting someone else's cash and keep yourself um, uh, in control in, in a business and so on. But that's just a whole business uh, by its own, right? Uh, I didn't do anything until I was at millions in sales where I brought in partners, but I got paid for that. I didn't need any more money on the balance sheet. So it was one of those uh, payoffs. My experience come from bootstrapping not from raising cash. I know some people who did great doing so and mm -hmm. some people who did very poorly. I think if you have a good, you just you need to be disciplined over what you're doing. And if you want to go in the VC round or private equity round, just be good at what you're doing. Make sure you, you know what you're doing. And it's, it's okay to start usually with friends and family before you reach uh, everyone else that usually would give you a little bit advantage here's the way i did that uh, i could have raised money early on i tried i didn't even know how i decided not to mess with that i continue what i did eventually i sold a piece of boxy charm when i did not need to sell a piece of boxy charm it was doing great it was profitable and i figured because i don't have to now it's easier for me to go with my conditions my terms and the money that comes in doesn't go on balance sheet because it's not needed i'll just take that cash out. So it was, uh, we, we said de risk or we call it secondary. So it really depends on how you do it and what, ideally you don't need to. And then when you want to sell a piece of your business to go and get some funders liquidity, you do it when you don't have to do it. So you get the best outcome and the best uh, valuation for your business. Yeah. So this is a very interesting question. Um, how did the business change and how did you have to pivot as, as, as Boxy Charm, you know, started growing, right? So $5 million a year, 10, 20, now we're way, way, way beyond that, right? So how, you know, as the company evolved, how did you deal with challenges and, and scale? Great business, great question. Uh, scaling a business is a challenge by itself. Companies, many companies just don't survive that. Uh, you'll yeah. see a big drop uh, once people get from zero to a million big drop, most companies don't pass a million. Then there is a very small percentage that get to 10 million and then 50 and 100 million. I think one out of 35,000 businesses uh, make it to 100 million. I have no idea what it is to my size. The, but then eventually from there on, they know that, okay, whoever passed 100 can actually scale uh, uh, higher because you, I guess the, in my, my particular advice would say, look, the, the challenge would be, many challenges will come along the way, but would be the quality of the people and in terms of managerial expertise and just experience period. We start usually a business with people that we find, friends, family, employees that are fairly junior because it's a new business. You're not gonna find a high level executive showing up in a business that grows 30,000 a month, right? Uh, but as you grow, uh, some people, you find out that um, you might not have the set of, uh, of expertise in the business that you need. So you have to start parachuting people from the top and that creates some animosity and so on. Some people don't like that and you got to go through this. That's part of the, uh, the challenges. But the biggest thing is you think of a tiered organization versus a flat organization. After a while, um, you cannot just run most of the operation, most of the uh, moving parts by yourself. You're going to fall apart. And you'll need some help. And my advice is always hire from the top, if you can, a person and don't just overly commit for a major title. Because if you find a person and you said, you're my COO, 
my chief operating officer. It's very hard after a while to find out, you know what, is actually a junior manager at best. It's, it's a 25-year-old kid, never really hired anyone that was, uh, never really managed more than two layers above him. It was just, he managed one layer and that's it. It was just, he told one person what to do. Now, when he has to have a vision of how to build a department, and he has no idea how to do it. Yet I can find him, but I'll have to tell him you're no longer the COO and he's going to be upset and that's going to hurt the business because I don't know. So it's just, don't commit for titles. Take your time with giving titles right away and expect to go and parachute people and tell them, look, we're bringing another person because what do you want to be? Do you want to be uh, a C-level at a $10 million a year company or a director at a $500 million a year company? What do you think the outcome is going to be better for you? Of course, you know what it is. Plus, you can always distrib distribute some stock options for those employees that just need some more grooming. Um, yeah. But tiering the organization would be the biggest obstacle. And for us, it took a while. We, we didn't just go right away. There, there's no CEO course that you get in any university. And because each business is its own animal, you just you get to figure it out when you get yeah. through that process. Yeah. A lot of students asking, what do you look for when you're hiring a person? What do I, what do I look for when I hire a person? Mm -hmm. um, so right now, uh, in terms of me dealing with hiring, I, I deal with certain positions because I'm more tactical and strategic on the marketing and the product side, I can tell you that I, I know already what I'm looking for. Uh, I will tell you what I'm not looking for. <laughs> it would be probably better uh, <laughs> since I don't do the hiring, okay? Uh, I'm, I'm not looking for someone that's not um, autonomous, okay? I want you to be autonomous, okay? I don't care if you have any degree, to be honest. I mean, I know you guys, are my, I don't care about any college degree, I mean, you can, I hope the dean's not watching, Joe. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, look, the, the fact is you can, you, I mean, you can come from Harvard, but still be an idiot. And you can come from Harvard and be smart. Like, I, it doesn't mean anything to me. I mean, I'll, I'll see. I mean, it, it depends uh, what it is. But ultimately, when I'm looking, uh, when I bring people in, uh, ideally is that I always look, think of it bigger than just what person I'm looking for. I'm looking to bring a person that's going to contribute something to the team. Even if you're a junior, I wanted to have something new that's going to elevate the rest of the juniors if it's a coordinator or a specialist i want them to be a little bit better so they can help everyone scale not going to be at the same point so always you want to bring people that are a little bit better mm -hmm. and inside of that and then if you're if you're say director and above don't expect us to teach you much like we'll give you orientation of the business but you're coming with a set of skills and if you don't have the, the skills that are needed you're not going to stay but if you're coming from uh, the bottom we will train you. It's all about training from coordinators and managers, senior managers. A lot of training are, are required because we believe that it's, it's okay. But anything that anyone that comes from above, there's different expectations for them to be the one training other people. So that's how uh, it looks. It's a bit complex, but it's fun. Yeah, um, I, can, I can only imagine. So uh, let's see, these are all related to Hiring questions. How do I call Joe for advice? <laughs> this, this is really, students want to talk to you. Um, well, we can share this recording after and then you let me know uh, what information we can share. Otherwise, you'll just have way too many people trying to contact you. Um, on a personal note, a um, few people want to know how you take care of your mental and physical health while you're running such a big organization. I see the weights got, back there. Um, I got some weights at the office. <laughs> I try to stay active. Uh, I mean, just a little military discipline uh, that I, I do. But um, I, honestly, my mental health was always okay. I was always happy when before I had anything, and I'm happy now when I have something. I, I never really have any stress that I, like I, I'm really calm. I will be stressed over something, but to, uh, over a problem that needs to be solved. Once it's being solved, I'm I'm okay. But it wasn't coming into, uh, uh, I don't know if you watched the Dave Chappelle show, but there was a part where he was talking about Anthony Bourdain's and he was yeah. saying the best job you can ever have in your life is flying over the world, right? It's like they're flying over the world, but then he goes and he hangs himself. And then he talks about another guy that was coming in and his wife took everything from him. He was supposed to be at the top of the world, going to Ivy League school for law school, but now he's working, selling shoes. And he said, 
That guy didn't even think about killing himself. So it's like, it really depends on who you are. So, <laughs> you know, it's, it's just a mindset. I, I don't think it's anything more than that. I love it. I love it. I, I agree on the mindset. I think it's it's the most important thing. Um, yeah. One more question on working with influencers. Um, how did you did you pay any of the very famous celebrities you've worked with, like the Kardashians and others? I mean, the Kardashian uh, family is, uh, you know, it's just we build relationship uh, with the family itself. Uh, and, uh, you know, I was fortunate enough to have uh, to have a company that brought their interest. We ended up talking, uh, you know, going to their homes and uh, just talking to them and eventually closing a deal. It wasn't anything uh, too complex uh, that you would think agencies talking to agencies. Uh, I, I, I never do that. It was going direct and, um, and that's it. I mean, mm -hmm. like anything else, I like to build relationships. So with many influencers, I like to really feel, talk to the people. And by the, by the end of the day, if, if those people, no matter how influential they are, if I just don't like them on a personal level and I, I don't do business with them. And that, yeah. that's, that's the bottom line. And uh, you just stay uh, true to who you are. But yeah, they are nice people, so, and I like them. That's the nice, the nice thing about being where you're at, right? You get to choose who you want to work with. It was way before. It was way before. Yeah. You, just, you just have to love yourself enough. And you know what? There are so many nice people. And then for the very few that are not nice, you really don't have to work with them. You just be cordial, and that's it. We're professionals. You know, hey, what's up? And that's it. Yeah. Um, so back to your... Uh, personal and, and you know your own development what are some of the things that you do to to keep up with trends uh, do you have a mentor how do you continue to grow and develop yourself uh, you know uh, it's um, it's the the people you're around uh, it, it's really gonna affect uh, everything in your life how you think so I was blessed to have partners that came in and I told you I sold a piece of boxy charm at the time and it was nothing uh, that the, the people that bought the company uh, or nothing but amazing friends and great mentors, people with perspective I never had before. They, it's a private equity. That's all they do. They take company publics. They've seen everything. And it's just great uh, friendships uh, that we built. I don't necessarily have or had a mentor, but mm -hmm. in time you start building a network of, of friends that, have different set of skills and you learn from them a lot. And one more thing I will say, as you keep your mind open and you keep humble, humble is a big word. I learn a lot from my staff, from coordinators in BoxyCharm. If you look at the trend and how you can stay relevant, I, I didn't know TikTok up until a few months ago because I learned that, okay, it's time to go and move to TikTok. I started noticing decline in, in engagement in our Instagram and I knew it's all moving to TikTok. So we said, well, I'm going to learn it and own it. And that's just what's going to happen. So we built a, like a little task force and we took a bunch of people, uh, different uh, team members that work in different projects. And I say, hey, let's go grab uh, lunch. Let's go to, I think it was Sugarcane. We, we grabbed lunch over there on a Saturday and we built a little task force and we started having a chat group talking about content over there. And before you know it, we're killing it on TikTok. And now you understand TikTok and before you, so it was, it was that or, or just, People out there have their perspective. Imagine that everyone has a different angle when they see it. I mean, I like to see it more of, I'm looking at, at, at things from my angle and I can see a position that you're not seeing. You can, mm -hmm. I can see an opportunity that you cannot see. So if you collect all those positions, if someone is, is a user of a platform, he's gonna give you something that you haven't heard of. He's gonna tell you what's trending right now. Everyone, and so you have a whole group of them, who do you think is gonna do better? So I listen to coordinators when it comes down to social media. Obviously we, we work and I put, kind of like a, a growth hacker glasses for them. And I said, this is how you actually grow. So now when you know the system, what do you, what do you think you can bring to the table? So I, I listen to them as well. So it doesn't have to be just big friends. I mean, I'm friends with other companies, Fashionova, the founder over there. So we're all friends, we're all sharing ideas, but we are all also learning from people that are young, that are touching those platforms and are, they know what's relevant. Yeah, yeah. So one more question for you. I know we're a little bit over time. Um, I think one of our invitations may have said five o'clock, but I, I don't think we have you on the docket for that long. I'm, I'm, I'm not going anywhere. That's all good. Oh, good. Perfect. So we'll keep chatting then. So future of BoxyCharm, what, what, what's next for you guys? Are you looking at different product lines? Any major goals that you can share? Yeah, I mean, I can share everything. I will say that... Um... Infrastructure is a big thing. Uh, we, when we started BoxyCharm, uh, I had uh, to make many decisions that had to be very critical for the future. And um, 
it was either investing in infrastructure or investing in products in a box and, uh, and, and influencers and relationship. And I bet on products. And I also bet on, on, um, on working with influencers. That was the investments that we made. And we kind of neglected certain pieces in our infrastructure on a fulfillment center and so on. So now it's a time to actually do it because we have quite a few programs that we launched last year and better in this year. But in order to have a pristine experience, we are moving into our facility. So we're done, we're almost done building our facility in uh, Kansas City. Uh, it's, it's, it's a big warehouse, it's the size of 10 football fields where everything is gonna be built and assembled over there. And instead of you, if you have your box and you also went on our store and you buy, you have a flash sale every month, um, instead of you receiving it in two different boxes, it's all going to go in one box. If you have multiple subscriptions, because you have Boxy Charm, you have Boxy Premium and Boxy Lux, everything is going to come in one uh, at one time. Everything is going to come uh, together. So it's just going to be a much better experience. But the idea is that now we have to make our infrastructure strong enough because we have grown so fast simply because I was really uh, investing in momentums. Every time when there is a particular momentum for a product, for anything else, I invested in that versus putting it on infrastructure because what I had was okay to make do. Now it's time to actually better the infrastructure because we have at least in the, the logistic infrastructure. So it might be kind of like grain boring what I told you and I'm, I'm sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> of course we have other plans for other programs. I can't talk about those stuff, but I, I think it's important to understand that momentum in, in your business is gonna be a key and, and you'll always have to ask what's more important. Is it more, uh, you have important and, and urgent and it's kind of like those two weights. And uh, I think that's one of the reasons we got to this point. Yeah, well, I mean, I can only imagine how many logistical issues you deal with. I mean, how many subscribers do you have now? Roughly? Well, it's over a million uh, boxes that we ship every month. And um, yeah. yeah, I mean, right now we work out over a third party, uh, three PLs, a, a logistic company, a third party logistics companies we just want to bring it eventually all in-house and, uh, and do it ourselves and uh, do it better um, and uh, we have a plan we have already the whole thing so by next year it's going to be solidified and things are going to move from there people will definitely feel a major impact delivery time is going to be shorter uh, the the quality of how they get it and so on is going to be there so when you buy a product it's all going to be with the box and it's all going to be at once so you don't have to wait for different boxes scattered throughout the month yeah yeah well, I definitely don't mind having different boxes come through the month. Well, I mean, for, for you, but, but for, us, for us, it's important because when you build, when you build a million plus boxes, 1.2 million boxes a month and growing, it's the size yeah. of a small country. It's just, a, it's just a, and everything has to ship within three, four days. It, it's, there aren't too many places that can actually produce so many boxes so quickly and ship them and dispatch them at the same time. So you have to have that uh, like knowledge how to do it and then to better the experience over there is much more complex so we're building automation it's going it's to look like an amazon warehouse a little bit with all the automations over there and it's going to be very exciting yeah wow that is incredible um do you anticipate growing the number of subscribers oh yeah we we still grow every month i mean it's a growing business we we have 70 million potential uh, consumers in the united states we're only having a million boxes shipped and uh, I haven't gone to Mexico yet. I mean, I barely played with Canada and then there's the, the UK, there's just so many other countries. So this is just the beginning. It's, for us, it's literally day one. Yeah, so going back to the future of the company, we have somebody tuning in from Austria and oh. asking when, yeah, when BoxyCharm might be available in Europe. Do you have plans for that? Yeah, Europe, yes, for sure. Uh, actually, people are buying our boxes globally right now. I can't speak to Austria. I don't know specifically, but uh, there are some carrier services. We, unfortunately, do not ship over there yet. The, the entering a country would take longer than you think if we want to do it right. Either we make a decision to distribute within, uh, within the, in the European continent to different countries or from the United States over there, and then custom officials and so on. There's just different regulations, but... Uh, I believe that by 2020, I know it sounds a lot, but hopefully by 2022, we can be there. Uh, so uh, yeah, but there are plans in place already. It's, it's not uh, just me speaking, we have plan in place to, uh, to spread globally. Awesome, awesome. I'm sure our Austria guest is happy to hear that. Yeah. Um, 
A question about how do you negotiate with all the brands that are in your box? And you have so many now, so I cannot even imagine how you begin to manage all of that. But how do you choose the brands that go in the box, and how do you how do you make that happen? So let's uh, let's get into negotiation. Okay, yeah, it was a question for for us when we started. We didn't know what to what do we want to do and so on. But uh, today, the way it works, it's actually straightforward. We pay the cost of manufacturing the product, we place it in a box, and mm -hmm. you can get an amazing promotion and it costs you absolutely nothing. Not only they get to sample your items in their hands, get a perceived value, uh, can fall in love with your product and resubscribe, but also you can have a lot of mentions and social media mentions. Uh, I mean, Kylie Jenner is one influencer, right? We have many variations. We send boxes to thousands of influencers. So if you were to go to influencers, it would cost you dearly, but with us, it's free. So why not? And um, the proposition sells itself. I mean, the idea for me was to create a win-win situation when I go with the product. And I learned that Boxer Charm is going to have partners and then consumers. The consumers are the charmers, the, the, the members that buy the box. And then the partners are the brands. And the mm -hmm. brands, uh, for us, it's give them the best-in-class marketing campaign for free. And who's going to say no for that? And believe it or not, at first they said no because they couldn't believe it. They thought there's a catch. It took us years and then many, many of their partner, friends, brands, <laughs> other brands to say, wait, well, Two-Face did this, uh, you know, Fenty did this. Okay, it has to make sense. Like, okay, mm -hmm. hourglass. So let's just go and do the same. It, it has to be real. But we, we have shift, shift the industry. The, the proposition is we pay you the cost of goods. It costs you absolutely nothing coming to the box. That's, That's it. So interesting. That's very interesting. You would think it'd be the other way around, right? People kind of see it as you're getting free product to put in this box. And, uh, it, it, that was the industry standard before we came. And if you want to be a disruptor, you said, well, can I find economics in my box that I don't need to get anything for free? Because you, you get a bag for stuff eventually. I mean, you, like, why would I give you my free stuff? What if I didn't make my return on investment? Yes, you go and you tell me that it distributes. Can you prove it to me? Can you get, well, not in this case, you don't need to because I'll pay you the manufacturing cost because I found that if I get a box that's not 10 or $12, now it's 20 $25. I can get five items in a box and I can pay the manufacturing cost and still turn profit. So I said, let's just go and change the price point and then solve that problem. So when the rest of the brand, the boxes were asking for, for free stuff, we're the one growing up, growing faster and with better products because I said, now I'll pay your goods for your goods, but because I can pay, I can be selective over the right products that are going to represent you better, going to give you better, uh, better awareness among our, our members, not just some, any item. And by the end of the day, our members are receiving full-size products. They get full experience. They get to be better, smarter shoppers. They know already that it wasn't a sachet sample or something. So everyone, it was the true win-win-win situation across the board. Yeah. Yeah. Are you able to share that kind of data with those brands um, as far as obviously the number of subscribers and the people who receive their products? Oh, yeah. They know that. Yeah. We, we publicize it. It's not a big deal. So that and then you know, return customers, right? Because I know, like, I just got a shipment of that Joya shampoo that was in your box a couple of months ago. Um, or you're saying if they go and they buy, if they repurchase. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So we, we, we don't have that type of data to the T. I mean, we have some. Um, mm -hmm. But we know that there is a, a fair amount of our members that if they like something, they go and they purchase. And brands go back and tell us that. I mean, uh, we had... Uh, a brand that worked with us and uh, I can't say the name, but uh, we're, they're very good friends. They're here locally and they said, look, uh, we just got into Ulta and we were, they were exclusive to Sephora for many years. They got uh, Ulta open up their doors for them as well. Um, and uh, when they got into Ulta, they said, as soon as we got into Ulta, they said, well, we want you to go to Boxycharm and do the same campaign that this other skincare brand did. And they drove traffic to stores with their members uh, and they grew their sales within the month of in 24%. So it was, it was the first time that, well, it wasn't the first time, but it was one of those times that you actually received data. Mm -hmm. How you, not only going, buying online on that, we would double company sales, they would, but actually physically going to stores and buying, especially after they tried their products, it's just, it drives product consideration. Uh, it makes the gondola as a destination when they walk into the stores because they just tried one of their items. So brands like it. Uh, the, the retention with brands is amazing. Yeah, it's great marketing. Um, 
Rafaela wants to know, um, how do you make sure that people receive products that are according to their preference? We can there is, um, I think that the, the short answer is we have a review. Uh, okay. and you review your box, you review the products and you tell us how it is. We have a, an algorithm that uh, later on score the items specifically for you. And, uh, and then it, it keeps optimizing itself. So we might miss some here and there. And, uh, but uh, ultimately it's kind of like a self-correcting, think of like a, 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 a targeted bomb, like a smart bomb that finds out to, it's just the same exact thing. Our algorithm keeps, if you are participating, tell us the experience, uh, go into the review and let us know, then it keeps improving the scoring. And next time we know what to give you. That's amazing. I mean, it takes me back to one of the questions when you were on um, in Deleep's, talking in Deleep's class for the Unicorn Entrepreneurship Program and uh, talking early on about how you were measuring the weights, right, of the boxes to make sure the shipping costs and all these things. I feel like so much has evolved, right, since then now being able to choose preferences of what's actually going in the box. I mean, are there still those logistical issues that you encounter with how much does it weigh? Does it matter to you anymore? I mean, how does that work? A little bit less. I mean, um, when we started, our volume was smaller, so our shipping rates were higher and we needed to be under a pound. Uh, since then, we, we have changed that. We actually raised the cost from 21 to 25. We can go above a pound, but then we can introduce larger size items. We have a whole new pound that we can play with. It. And the, the, the delta between one pound and two pounds was very small. So uh, just the volume was different. I mean, from 40,000 subscribers, no, that's 10,000 going to whatever it is now, million plus, and it doesn't really matter anymore. That is awesome. All right, so one final question for you, unless there's anything else that you want to share after, but um, what's, what's on the horizon for BoxyCharm in the next five years? Where do you see the company, and would you ever take it public if that's something you've considered? So, I mean, I can't break everything and definitely tell you that it's going to be a multinational business. Uh, more than, I mean, it is already, but it's going to be not just Canada, it's going to be in other economies. Uh, I don't like to tie too many uh, explanations of how it's going to play out because the market is dynamic. And the, the idea is that if you say, well, it's going to be in the hands of many more consumers, absolutely. It's going to have more programs for members who subscribe. Uh, ideally, we want to look at this as a, a club and a membership. Not, it's not a subscription box per se. The subscription box would get you in. It would always be amazing and we're never going to change that. The idea is that there'll be programs that would tag along, which you'll get either for free or uh, opportunity to, uh, to do other things. So for instance, where we added our e-com program, add-on program to buy items that are pennies on the dollar every month only for our members. And you'll be able to find products that sell exclusively in, in uh, high-end department stores, uh, beauty related, right? But you'll get them for literally nothing. Like a $130 cream uh, you can buy it for twelve dollars, so on. So you can. So this is kind of like one perk that we decide that every month is going to come in. But we want to build more along that line. So you can say, well, I'm 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 staying subscribed no matter what, because it gives me access to so many more things. And in the future, that's where you're going to see Boxycharm gives you more and more access to uh, to a portal that you wouldn't get anywhere else unless you're a member. Yeah, yeah. So you are awesome. I am so excited that we got to, to interview with you today. Is there anything that we didn't cover that you want to share uh, with the audience? Um, well, I have nothing, but hopefully next time uh, we can do it uh, in an audience. Uh, I know. I, I, I'm okay with Zoom, but I mean, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> I know, no. it's not the same. Usually we would be having some cocktails after this and, and networking yeah. with everybody yes, and, exactly. uh, and alumni. Yes, um, so, I mean, I. I it would be nice to go back and, and see people for real and uh, not covering themselves. So hopefully it's going to be over soon and uh, mm -hmm. we can do it uh, in different places. I hope so as well. We're, we're starting to, to come back to campus. Um, a lot of other things are still happening virtually, but slowly but surely the students are starting to come back. And so we hope to be able to do that soon and host you back when you're available. But this has been great, Joe. Thank you for spending so much time with no us. Thank awesome. you very much. You are the best. No, you Thank are. I'm, I'm super <laughs> between you are the best. Thank you very much. Uh, you're so sweet. All right, Thank Joe, you. we'll talk soon. Thanks. Thanks everyone Thank for joining us. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.